Um, our next session is being brought to you by Stantec, and we are very grateful for their support for Building Nations. I would now like to introduce Tim Williams, Strategic Growth and Business Development Director for Water at Stantec. Leveraging over 25 years in the sector, Tim helps water organisations to meet the challenges of a highly regulated and commercial environment. Between operations, regulation, strategic planning and delivery, Tim's extensive experience in the water industry helps him deliver leading solutions for water entities, both large and small, throughout the UK and Ireland. Please welcome Tim to the stage. Well, thank you. I suppose having arrived in, in, in Wellington on, on Monday and here the other day, I'm still not quite sure uh, what day of the week it is. So hopefully I'm here on the right day at the right time. So, um, Tanakoto Katoa, um, Borodar, um, good morning. So um, I've got a, a, a slot here really to talk about water reform and to, to sort of take, you, take some of you through the, the UK journey, um, but also to take, to take you through my journey through the UK journey. And it's when I look back at 30 years in the sector that I suddenly feel like the forest gump of the water industry, which is quite frightening, isn't it? And you go, actually, I was observing water reform from 1993 when I joined the sector um, through, to, in, through to now, really, in 2023, when water reform in the UK is, is still on, ongoing. So I suppose what qualifies me to talk about water reform? Well, it's the fact that I suppose I spent 12 years in, in Yorkshire water during a period of, of turmoil, which I'll, I'll talk about in a little while. And then moved through um, through, contract op through contract operations, operating Welsh Water's assets, then to work with Welsh Water and uh, and to run their strategy and planning team, and to build their asset management function uh, from pretty much a standing start, through to um, only very very recently in the last five years when I moved from being a client um, to to joining Stantec, and then looking at the water sector in the UK uh, from afar. So I suppose my first Hollywood reference of two, so it's up to you with these spot the second really, is the fact that I almost feel that as an onlooker and looking back, I go, do you know, if I'd known what I was seeing at the time, I'd have probably take, taken more notice of it. Um, however, the views I suppose I'm going to express are, are my own from my time in, in, in the sector. Um, so just please bear with me and then I'll generally go through actually where the UK is today. So um, bear with me if I turn the glass on, on and off. I'm at that point in my life, I'm not quite sure where my focal length is. So stick with me. Yeah? Okay, so why is the uh, UK water sector of, of interest and relevant to, uh, to, to New Zealand? Well, dispersed population. High population centres, if you look at London, Glasgow, Liverpool, Sheffield, but some incredibly rural areas. I suppose I look back to my time in Dua Cymru, Welsh Water, and actually in my time here in, uh, in New Zealand, you know, in the past few days really, when I've been travelling around and thinking, oh my God, what an absolutely amazing place that you, you, that you live within. I look at Wales and I go, actually, population centre on the coast, really, really underpopulated, you know, mid Wales, mountainous terrain, and a, la and a large, uh, long coastline. And I think actually there are, there are some comparisons that can and, and should be drawn. And in fact, I remember making an argument to, to the regulator um, a few years ago about a super rurality claim to say, actually, it must cost more to operate in certain areas where it's actually super rural. And you know, it comes back to, and this is where you get into, uh, into I suppose, regulation, which is obviously a topic uh, that's key here, that the regulator then comes back to me and says, yes, but you've got some really built up areas. So surely you can put, a count, you put the counterfactual forward that tells us actually you're more efficient when you operate in, in really sort of densely populated areas. And that kind of flummoxed me for a very short while. But as you can see, highly, highly relevant um, and just a bit uh, at a different point in the journey. So in terms of the, I suppose, the track record that the UK has gone through, and I will go through the, the steps that need to be taken in the future, because the, the future is certainly looking incredibly challenging. Um, £180 billion pounds, um, invested, that's capital investment over the past 30 years, um, looking at uh, bathing waters, looking at sewer flooding, uh, supply, supply interruptions, really, really key to, um, to our customers. Uh, low pressure and in particular um, drinking water quality um, and as you can see um, leakage but bills are, are around 120 pound lower per annum um, than they would have been prior to reform in 1989 
Um, so you can see what, what's been achieved. There's so much more to do. And I was talking to someone, someone this morning, actually, water supply and sanitation is, at the, is the bedrock, isn't it, of, of public health. And the trouble is water supply and sanitation isn't necessarily a great vote winner. And it's much easier to go away and say, I'll spend money on hospitals, I'll spend money on schools, than I will on water supply and sanitation. But what was key, uh, and I learned in 2020 and 21, you thought during those interesting um, COVID lockdown periods, is water supply and sanitation is at the bedrock, absolutely at the bedrock of, of good public health services. So there is more, definitely more to be done. And if you look at the um, capital expenditure uh, by the water industry across England and Wales, and I will very briefly talk a little bit about Scotland as I go through this presentation, but I have a far better expert following me in, in, in Alan, so um, uh, please feel free to ask Alan about Scotland rather than me. Um, you can see that capital expenditure across the water industry in England and Wales was falling, really, um, sort of pre-reform in 1989. And so one of the reasons for reform was to, was to raise money, really, to invest in, in quality, in the implementation of the drinking water directives, the urban waste water treatment directive, and to improve uh, water service and sanitation um, across England and, England and Wales. But that's coupled with, um, as you can see in that right-hand chart, a fairly modest um, bill increase in order to pay for it all, because a lot of this investment is amortised over the long time, and in particular, looking at the life of the asset. So the water bill in, the, in England and Wales at the moment, and across the UK, is about you know, £500 on annum, uh, per annum on, av on average, um, and, that, and, and you can separate that out into uh, water and, and wastewater services. But interestingly, in the background of this, the, uh, this has been against the highest level of investment in the water sector in Europe. Um, but still, the water bill um, in, in the UK is at or around um, the European median um, or mean. So, again, that's been driven by big efficiency gains, uh, workforce change, change in working patterns in order to make sure that the, the sector delivers efficiently um, and effectively during that time. And I suppose having been a recipient of, uh, of regulation, to have a regulator who is, who is looking at comparative performance uh, while you're doing so. So I'll take you a little bit through the journey now. So, and I, and I appreciate some of you um, or many of you will have, will have heard this before. So I'm gonna talk a bit about the last 30 years. So I won't particularly, I won't labor that, that point particularly. Um, but I'll also talk about the press. So here we are in um, 1858, um, the popular press at the time, I won't try and draw comparisons with, with today. Um, punch there, you know, looking at the Thames, uh, the great stink of 1858, um, and, the, and the, the main sewers being driven under Fleet Street, and then the construction of the Thames Embankment. So 1858, we had a press that was talking about sewage, we had a press that was talking about, about sanitation, and was partly the driver behind investment in sanitation um, starting uh, in, in London and also in the, in the northern cities. So you can see there that already, um, quite a long time ago, the popular press was playing a role in influencing the public and political agenda in the water sector. This is a point I will come to I'll come to you later. So reform started not in 1973 or in 1989. Reform started pretty much in the late 1850s um, in the UK. However, I'll go forward a little bit. So UK water industry reform, 1970, and I'll come to some of the numbers in, in a short while. Um, really localised and fragmented water providers. Um, Pre-1973-1974, the water boards, yep, the, 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 those, those uh, local, local council uh, run water boards. And I, when my, uh, my in-laws refer to the water board, I do point out to them that the water boards have not existed since 1974, um, a point which they are still um, coming to terms with. Um, you know, so you can see here, you know, a consolidation between 1973 more consolidation and reform um, in uh, it's actually sort of phase one, 73 to 89, and then big reform. Uh, you know, if you, we talk about financing between 1989 and 2023, and it will it will continue. Um, so to, to quickly jump to the numbers, 
two and a half thousand or so service providers uh, uh, pre nineteen you know, pre pre nineteen sixties around the, around the nineteen sixties. Uh, waterboards, really, yeah. So, yeah, and I've worked in some of their head offices, which still exist uh, in, in parts of uh, England and Wales, where the companies haven't sold them off. Um, and also, you know, village councils, local water supplies, um, and pretty much unregulated. And then the journey into the seventies. This is where I talk about my in-laws. Um, 1300 sewage and sewage disposal authorities rationalized into 10 water authorities by the 1973 water act that that drove that 1974 water reform all assets were transferred to those uh, those 10 water authorities I'm, I'm, I'm talking about um about england and wales here and as well as that an environmental regulator um, came into being when the 29 river authorities were then rationalized into the, the single national rivers, rivers authority uh, lovingly referred to as the nra prior to it then becoming the environment agency in 1995 i think um scotland again you know it's, it's again some change um, in uh, through the sort of scottish um, regional and island councils and i'll come more to scotland um, later on so you can see the pattern of, of water supply and sanitation in the uk was pretty much set uh, in terms of the geography so we'll we'll come to this in a little, in a little while so then 1989, uh, further reform principally um, around funding. So further rationalisation, and, and, and I'll, I'll look at the lower chart here, where 1989 you had water and, 10 water and sewage companies and then 29 water only companies. So we still had these 29 fairly small by in relative terms water only companies if you look at that sort of top that right hand chart there you can see where those water only companies the walks um, are but further rationalization continued after that point so for example york york waterworks which was a, a small water only company serving the city of york uh, was bought by yorkshire water um, in the sort of late late 90s early 2000s and so, and so rationalised further, that, that abstraction, that treatment works was subsumed into the wider Yorkshire water machine. But even more recently, um, the Pennant Group, who run Southwest Water, that's what Devon and Cornwall, um, then bought Bristol Water, which again was, was a, a water only company, and that only happened last year. So if you think reform is complete, it's just an ongoing, an ongoing journey. And South Staffordshire Water, which is kind of uh, West Birmingham, really, has quite a large population it serves as the southeast water so we still have a disparate group of water only companies um, who are almost like who work inside um, the larger water and sewage company um, area and then if i just looked at ownership if you bear with me i saw my eyesight out um, it, there's been multiple ownership models that have happened and continue to happen and change um, during this time. So we've got government-owned Scottish Water, East Area and Irish Water, um, and Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland Water. Um, they're moving down that, that, that sort of bottom bracket. You know, a large amount now, late 90s, these, these happen early 2000s, um, of listed companies bought into private equity. Um, which again changed the financing arrangements of some of, some of these organizations and the bubbles here are broadly meant to be proportional to to customer base but you can see the growth in private equity um, has happened over the past sort of 15 years or so still listed on the stock exchange in, in london is um seven trent water and united utilities so big populations there and then finally uh but and last but not least and very close to my heart having worked there for 12 years is the not-for-profit entity um do a Welsh Water. So a little bit of history here. So um, the uh, uh, our government administration in 1997 uh, brought in a windfall tax. And around that point, a number of companies had diversified um, into a range of a range of projects and businesses. It'd be wrong of me to say over diversified, but some might say that. And so that 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 kind of diversification plus uh, the windfall tax changed the risk profile of some of these organisations. And so at that time, uh, Welsh Water, as so they do come Welsh Water, sort of fell out of Hyder Pell Sea uh, and was set up as a not for profit organisation owned and wholly financed by Glass Cymru. Um, so the only not for profit water company um, in, the, in the UK. Um, and then uh, I was in Yorkshire Water in the late 90s when this happened, and Yorkshire Water looked at should it become a registered community asset mutual, uh, what we termed the RCAM, where the, the assets will be transferred into an asset-owning company, 
and then people would be in a, an asset operating company. Um, so there was a real shift in ownership, I'd say late 90s, early 2000s, and in order to Welsh, for Welsh Water initially to make that model work, um, Welsh Water outsourced all of its operations um, initially to United Utilities Operations Services. So Welsh Water de-risked its operation to do this by saying, actually, uh, we will have a, a very hard-driven contract uh, with UUOS um, and, then, and, and then develop that over time. And I'll come to the model um, in a little while. But you can see how, again, a, a theme that I'm working to here is that reform is, con is, a, is a continuum and it is never, um, never, ever um, complete. So if I move on to um, core activities, um, during this time of, of business reform, um, there were various different models trialed, operated to, and I was talking to um, somebody yesterday um, afternoon, where, you know, it, it's, it, some organizations want to do it for themselves, some organizations think that it's more cost effective if they outsource it to other organizations to do so, and some organizations think that that's actually even better if they can create their own non-regulated business and provide those services to other organizations. So the needle I put on this dial here always, it has changed over the 30 years for every company out there, where some companies just did everything themselves. However, others have found that, that the incentivization mechanisms um, and the efficiency that can be gained by transferring those operations into third-party providers has provided with them with the ability to meet efficiency targets that the regulator um, says they need, they need to meet. And then others um, have set up separate non-regulated businesses to provide that service to their own business um, as well as others. So it's been a degree of complexity. And I suppose back to my, I suppose, Forrest Gump analogy, this has happened in time where companies have outsourced, insourced, created their own, their own companies to provide this, these services, and it's pretty much changed um, as time has moved on. And the Welsh water, mod water model I alluded to earlier pretty much had that needle nearly you know, on that right-hand side where when I first joined Welsh Water in 2007, uh, about 120 to 140 people were the number of people who were directly employed by that entity, which was serving a population of about 3 to 3.3 million people. And the rest of it was dealt with through other parties. So, uh, you know, billing providers, contact centre providers, that, that kind of thing. Uh, but over time, um, uh, that, that organisation decided, actually, we need to be a capable client in order to manage our contracts effectively. We need to bring some of that service back inside. And that's generally where that needle, um, needle now, now sits. But you can see it's a continuum. Um, and actually, there's no, there's no right size and one size fits all. So the water industry today is a, is, it's a blend of all that change that's happened over the past 30 years, including the, reg, the regulators. So you have a different, a different setup in, in Scotland, a different setup in Northern Ireland, a different setup in, in the Republic of Ireland, and, but generally England and Wales is all regulated by Ofwat, but because of devolved powers um, to, to Wales and, and, uh, and to others, you can see that actually there's a separate environmental regulator in Wales to that which there is in England, so Natural Resources Wales uh, versus the Environment Agency, but it's the same drinking water regulator, so the Drinking Water Inspectorate is the same organisation in England as it is in, in Wales. So you can see it's, it's trying, trying to come to terms with the fact that you're, you, some days you'll be dealing with a, one regulator who serves your, your government down in Cardiff Bay versus another regulator who serves DEFRA um, over in London. And then the parts of um, England that are lucky enough um, to be served by Welsh Water, such as Hereford uh, and Chester, you know, again, have, can have some different in service providers. But Seven Trent, you know, we talked about um, rationalisation earlier. Seven Trent Water bought D Valley Water uh, uh, last year, like last, uh, uh, actually, a couple of years ago now, and then have, have them brought that into their, into their wider, wider scope of works. Um, so you can see here what's happened. It's just consolidation on consolidation, but, but that, that reform continues. So the, uh, the timeline I'm going to work to here, bear with me, um, is I'll, I'll pick a few out, but I will focus on recent, recent years, probably because that's of, certainly of more interest. But I was talking to somebody about flooding, which I think is, is relevant here in particular, where 2007 there were some significant floods um, in, in England, uh, big, big floods in England, in particular in the northeast of England. 
And that led, if you look at that point, 2008, was completion of the pit review, um, learning the lessons from the 2007 floods. And the setup in, in, in England and Wales and, and is, is broadly, multi parties are, are accountable for, for drainage um, and, and flood defence. And what the pit review said is that, you know, we've got to try and rationalise some of this because how does a customer know who to speak to in terms of do they speak to their local authority, do they speak to the environment agency, do they speak to their water company? When they speak to their water company, their water, their, their water company provider goes, oh, that's private sewer, that's nothing to do with us, I'm sorry. You know, you're just going to have to ring a local drainage company and get that one sorted. So in 2010, we had the Flood and Water Management Act. And then in 2011, down here, um, all the sewers that were previously private sewers, and this is previously 1937 Public Health Act, by boy, was sewers law, um, were then transferred overnight um, into the ownership um, of the England and Welsh uh, water companies. So trying to rationalise sewers to make sure that your customer doesn't have to deal with multiple parties when things start to go wrong, which was the main, which the main driver. It's just not fair on a customer who's, who's got a blockage going on to go, no, I'm sorry, mate, ring, uh, ring drain care. So, I th and then finally, I suppose, 2019, we're now in the quinquennial planning period in England and Wales. Scotland works, thankfully, I think, to longer planning periods um, of uh, AMP 7. So we worked uh, five-year planning periods and I think, I feel personally, that's still not long enough. So we are now in AMP 7. A few companies appealed that to the Competition and Markets Authority um, in December uh, 2020, um, both off what, and both companies that went to the Competition and Markets Authority will say they did all right out of it. So let's look to today. Um, and it's going to be, it's been a, a fascinating, absolutely fascinating journey. And if you look at the politicisation of the water sector, which I'm going to come to, um, this is where it's, it's getting quite painful sometimes and where I say there's always, always going to be more to do. So uh, we currently operate on new price limits in 2020. They run to 2025. Um, so pretty stable investment planning period, expenditure period. Um, uh, changed a little bit by COVID. So two years of, of companies slowing down their expenditure programs has compressed five years worth of expenditure into three years at the end of this planning period, uh, which has given us some challenges. Uh, we had a brilliant summer in 2020. It was great to be at home. Um, but then drought in 2022. Who would have thought, and I, I feel I'm almost paraphrasing H.G. Wells here, who would have thought in the early days of the 21st century nearly half of the UK population would be in the grips of a hosepipe ban or an end of use ban. So even now in 2022, uh, Thames Water, Yorkshire Water, uh, South West Water um, had hosepipe bans in place last summer and South West Water uh, about two months ago ex extended that ban to include uh, the city of Plymouth. So, I'm missing, I'm missing the, the hottest weekend of the year so far coming. And so I'm enjoying the, uh, the New Zealand winter. Um, however, I'll, uh, you know, hopefully I'll get a bit of a summer in July. But even now I, I can see companies are preparing for, for water use restrictions in 2022. And as somebody who worked for Welsh Water, where you would think it's a, a, a uh, part of the UK that is rich in rainfall, um, uh, host pipe ban in Pembrokeshire, in West Wales in 2022 was pretty much un unheard of. So drought and water, sc water scarcity, I'll come to, to come to shortly. Then, um, and this is where I'll come to the press a bit more, um, what came to the fore is that there were a large amount of storm overflows that were overflowing more than people think they should. So just for those of you who don't know, an awful lot of the UK um, has combined sewers, which means that uh, when it rains, foul sewers overflow in, into watercourses. And two things have happened to um, provide us with this information. One of which is, is COVID related, where people and communities, because they were at home for the better part of two years, became far more in touch with their local aquatic environment. You know, speaking personally, I was walking around, you know, where I live and going, you know, I never even knew those were over there. And suddenly people um, in the United Kingdom were far more in touch with their local aquatic environment and using it for leisure and therefore 
we're looking at it and going, actually, this isn't, in, this isn't what should be happening here. So we have a population now that is really much more in tune with the water cycle um, than they were in 2019. Fascinating, fascinating shift, and that's not going to go away, to the extent that um, the first inland bathing water was designated as serpentine in London you know, back in the, the early 90s. The second one, the second inland bathing water was designated the other, the other year, but recently in Ilkley, in the River Wharf um, at the base of Ilkley Moor. So that is, the, that is a, a, an, another action, inland bathing water in Ilkley, in North Yorkshire, which again has to meet, meet tighter standards. And that is because people are demanding they use their, their local watercourses for leisure. The growth in, in open water swimming, um, paddleboarding, kayaking, the use of people's environment is a fantastic thing. What that, is, what that has exposed is a, a, a performance shortfall. Um, in the wastewater network. Secondly, and I think of greater significance uh, is the growth in event and duration monitoring. So five or six years ago, uh, a, a huge amount, uh, I suppose technology has allowed uh, the um, event and duration monitoring to be installed on um, the combined sewer overflows and, and storm sewers in, in England, Wales and Scotland, uh, um, where actually now there's a, a, a vast amount of data and technology that tells us what is actually going on and prior to that we didn't really know what's going on. And now again, customers are demanding to know when I go and visit St Ives or when I, when I go onto Brighton Beach, I want to know what's my local environment going to be? Is it safe for me to swim? So there is now getting near to be live reporting for some companies on what has been happening in their network where their customers are going to be using um, those leisure facilities. Now, that's going to drive a huge amount of expenditure. That's not, it's not an issue. So then the 2023 Environment Act basically says um, uh, zero flows will be limited to 10 spills per year, and that investment will take place over 15 years. Okay. This is where the water sector in the UK has become politicised. Well, in, in England and Wales, it's not quite, you're not quite seeing that in Scotland, where now, the, if, uh, so the uh, current administration signed off that Environment Act, and you can now go on a website and look for your MP and go, you know, that individual is now in favour of polluting waterways because they signed up an act in favour of CSOs spilling 10 times per year to the watercourse. Okay, with me so far? Now, only two months ago, the, the opposition party, having, you know, had some parliamentary time, went, you know, we're on to be a winner here. So we'll now submit a private member's bill that, demands that all zero flow, all, that, that there are no CSO spills to watercourses at all. Okay, so the opposition go, you know, we can get one over the Conservative Party here. We're going to submit a bill and it's going to be put forward in Parliament that says there are no overflows. Yep, in the full knowledge it's going to be defeated because that will put, that's going to cost probably about getting on for over £100 billion worth of investment to re sewer the UK. So, you know, really, really political, political instrumentation is going on here where op opposition go, right, election 2024, we can now begin to set our stall out that the Tory polluters are in favour of overflows, overflowing to the, uh, to the watercourses. Yep. So parliamentary time used to go, no overflows, defeated, the press then goes, God, you know, we've got one here, the government's in favour of pollution. So you, you can see how... The politicisation of the water sector is, is moving in, in, the, in the UK one year thereabouts before an election, and you're, what, three months before an election? I'm not quite sure of your timeline. And uh, so, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting place to be. So, and now, I'll reflect a, a little bit before I go back to CSAs. So, uh, I did a survey uh, September 2020. Um, a difficult time to survey people because uh, they were all at home. Uh, we did about 200 um, people, so customers, regulators, water, water company employees, um, members of the public on what do you think about ownership and the, and the business model of the water sector um, in, the, in, in, in England and Wales? So top three, and we, and we gave, them, gave them the opportunity to vote on this, was top three was a regulated not-for-profit private, I would say, this is close to my heart, that's the Welsh water model. Next one would be a regulated government owned, so um, for example, Scottish Water. And then third was regulated privatised, so standard kind of Thames Water, uh, Yorkshire Water. What got no votes at all uh, was public water authority, unregulated, so 
uh, in terms of moving back to sort of pre-89. And then uh, having your local council um, run, your, run your water supply and sanitation. So I think people now are sort of bought into the fact that they're, you know, they're used to the various models out there, but don't want to look back. And then we looked at how should it be organised? Um, so what, which business model do you think achieves the best positive balance for UK water sector stakeholders? Quite a difficult question, but there you go. Um, should, should we disaggregate it, i.e. have a separate, uh, you know, a separate supply for water network, separate supply for water networks, separate supply for retail, or should it be fully, integrated, fully vertically integrated where you do source to tap? Seem to see. Well, 91% basically said, we need to know where we are, source to tap, seem to see. Pretty straightforward, that's what you'd expect. So water industry trends, and this is where, again, where, where I'm seeing the sector going, I'll, I'll move to politicisation before I finish. Um, population growth, let's, let's look at the top here. So population growth, the UK has grown by a, a large amount in the last 30, 30 years. So population growth, so, so new capacity, and it is the job of the water undertaker to work with the local authorities to go, where's that population gonna be? Where do we need to grow? Big trend there. Demographic change, customer behaviors. Customers demand more. They demand better quality, they demand a better environment, and they just want to, they just want to be able to just have that. That customer expectations are now even higher than they were, you know, when, when I was in Whistle Drops. Climate change, adaptation, and mitigation. We we know what's happening in terms of where we are. You know, look at the drought that's happened um, in the UK and, and and in this part of the world. Um, but it's how do we adapt and, and mitigate to what we see as a changing and less predictable climate as well. So. That brings me into resilience. How do we make sure our systems, you know, we get into systems thinking and, and we are more resilient overall. New technology and innovation, I've talked a little bit about um, the growth in monitoring and data, but what that then, then does is it gives us the opportunity to, to run our networks, both water and wastewater in, in real time. You know, we are now in a world of smart, of smart networks on, on water supply, um, and we are probably now moving into a, a world of where we can, have storm readiness built into our network, into our, into our wastewater networks remotely when we can identify where rainfall is coming through good rainfall radar data. So it's how do we have our, our, our networks dynamic enough and operated enough that we know we need to go and jet that pipe there because we, we, we've got a storm coming in seven days. Um, resource scarcity, I won't talk much about, you know, I'll talk about droughts, I won't go there, but also about energy recovery. How do, how do we use what we've got? Interestingly, if we have less, if we have less storm overflows, that's going to give me more solid matter going into the uh, wastewater treatment processes. How can I then use that um, in order to run uh, uh, thermal hydrolysis plants, for example? Affordability. You know, we've looked at energy. I don't know, I don't know what the energy bills are um, in, in this part of the world, but I think the energy price cap in the UK was set at two and a half thousand pounds, two thousand six hundred pounds last year. Um, energy poverty is a real thing um, in the UK. Uh, we do not want people entering water poverty, but I'll come to what we need to do in a bit. AG infrastructure. Um, I think if I can. Uh, I think someone someone quoted the other day at. I think it was Becky Woods yesterday, it said there's a legacy of asset maintenance and forward-thinking asset management. The implied asset life, the implied sewer life um, in the UK, and, you know, I won't quote my company, is about 700, 750 years. So if you just look at the renewal rate over, over total length, we are, we are putting pops in the ground today, which we expect to, we expect to operate for getting on for nearly a thousand years. Now, it's not up to me to tell it's wrong, but it doesn't quite feel where we need where we need to be. So aging infrastructure, maintenance and renewal needs, I think, have to be looked at in form of a, a genuine and authentic manner as to what really, really is out there and stop kicking the can down the road for future generations. And then we have environmental community value. And this, this gets back to our customers being closer to their being close to their environment and in particular how do we make sure we deliver for our customers when we build solutions? So if we're going to put nature-based solutions in to deal with zero flows, how do we provide an amenity for our customers so they are then close to what that, what that facility provides? That's really, really important to me. And, and you know, when I looked at this in the past, we looked actually, how do we get our customers close to their local wastewater and water treatment network so they have more buy-in when we need to change it? So 1858, this is what the press was saying. 2022, 2023, 
This is what the press is saying. So, you know, there's nothing new under the sun is there. The press is what the press does. Um, so, state of water in the UK, yeah, that was about a drought, yeah. Uh, you know, poor performance is now the norm for some water firms, warns off what about serious pollution. And I'm sure you'll have seen, or, or some of you will have seen, uh, Water UK, the trade body, put an apology out for poor performance. I think three chief executives have decided to forego their, their bonuses, um, their comment. Uh, okay, so 1858 to here, you know, spot the difference, isn't it, really? Um, so what does this mean for going into, into AMPE? And I, you must um, indulge me for, uh, I suppose, uh, facing here, here in England and Wales. I think, I think that we'll see the same in Scotland, but we're not as soon. Fairly level expenditure over, over the time, for instance, 1989. Um, that's in 21, 22 prices. We are likely to see a big increase in investment in, in, in AMPAIT. Um, two to three times on enhancement um, between, uh, over that scene before. And what I think Chris Hipkins was saying yesterday was it's about capacity and capability and a shortage of global water talent. And absolutely, absolutely, I am seeing a shortage of global water talent. And it worries me that if the media are portraying the water sector in, in a way that is negative, that will then, dis, I suppose, stop people from being attracted to that sector. Because, you know, wh wh why would you want to ha wh want your mum and your dad and the people you see down the pub to say, bloody hell, what are you doing about this? So it, they, it's a bit, of a, a bit of a spiral. We want the media to say the water sector is a brilliant place to work, don't we? Because then we can attract people to the sector. Macro level challenges, I'm just going to run out of time, so it'll be really quick here. So, other issues to see high inflation. Yep, so double digit inflation, 9, nine to 10%. Energy price increases, big issue on bills. And don't forget, in the UK, we have an RPI or CPIH linked uh, escalator on, on bills. So, if you're paying 10% more on bills, and then we have an investment program, great than ever. Imagine what the implications of that are going to be. Skill shortages, reducing sewage bills, and affordability challenges. So, Bills are going to have to go up in real terms in, the, in, in England and Wales to pay for um, the, uh, the reduction in sewer overflows. That's, that's known. And then other external factors are the drive to, to achieve net zero by 2030, wider public perception, how do, we, how do we shift that, and then alternate industries offer better, offer better margins, so attracting investment into the sector. So some final thoughts, and I'll go through all, all these. Um, scale has helped. So cross-region investments in certainty of funds, so having that five-year investment planning cycle, seven years in Scotland, has been incredible in terms of, I can plan ahead. You know, in Welsh Water, I, was, I, I looked at an investment programme out to 2050. That was my job, was to go, where do I need to be in 2050 and what are the milestones to get there and to hold that course. Comparative and robust regulation has been key. I, you know, it's hard to say this hasn't been regulated, but to sit there and know how I am related to others, both in terms of performance, around efficiency and effectiveness is really important. I want to know how, how good I am, yeah? Um, and progressive long-term asset management model. I would, I would say to scan it, being um, head of our strategy planning in, in a couple of companies, long-term asset management allows you um, to have better decision-making. Um, in the negative, you know, more long-term joint I think is needed. Um, and I'll move down to these, this, this final point. Ma maintenance is often the poor relation. How do we have a sector which sees maintenance and, and that, that good asset management as core to the business and staying close to those you serve. So our 30 years, I mean, my, my, my conclusion would be, gosh, that, that's frightening, isn't it? Um, don't look back. It's all, you've got to look forward, you know, what do you want to achieve? And a recent lesson to me, five, five years ago, I was there again, you know, investment in the environment's done, isn't it? We're, we're on good quality, drinking water is great. It's just, we're now going to move to this brilliant maintenance planning cycle. How wrong could I have been seeing 15 years of environment investment and drought-related investment ahead of me? Yeah, it, that's a surprise, yeah? So the journey of reform is never, ever, ever complete. So the sooner you get started, the senior on that, on that journey. And don't let, and this, I, I was going to write this, but don't let perfection be be defeated by good enough so you know just to just go for good enough because you're never going to achieve perfection because it's just always going to be changing and then finally and in particular to me when i was looking out to 2050 was have a long-term vision and hold a steady course you know steer by that star that you pick and while all around you is going bonkers and you've got drought or flooding you just need to make to hold your course steady while you're in a storm and i suppose to quote kipling you know, if you can keep your head when all about you're losing theirs, 
Yours is the earth and everything that's in it. And by that, I mean in terms of stewardship. Um, and my final quote really here is um, to quote that great uh, philosopher, um, Ferris Bueller. Um, Life moves pretty fast, yeah? And if you don't stop and look around once in a while, you're just going to miss it. So you're embarking on water reform. It's a fantastic place to be. It's going to be a journey, not necessarily a destination. But the world is watching because it's fascinating. So thank you. Thank you so much, Tim. I think there were some really great key learnings that all of us could learn from today. Thank you. Um, do you have time for one question? Do, yeah. I think we'll go with the most popular question, which is based on your extensive experience, can you see any mistakes being made by New Zealand currently with respect to our re border reforms? And what can we do to address these? That's, that's a very leading question, isn't it? Um, I suppose I, I look at mistakes made in the past, which I've seen, and it's a combination of staying close to your communities because they're the communities that you serve, but to have enough scale that you, that you are efficient. So I think I, I look at the, you know, the number of entities that, that is, still, is still shifting in, in my limited knowledge of what you're doing, and it's how do you make sure that, the, that your entities are set up in a way that is efficient or set up in the full knowledge that reform is going to be continuous anyway. So, yeah, you're never going to get it right, but just go for it. Thanks so much for your time today, Tim. If we could give him another round of applause. Thank you.